And what we're going to do is compare Lamentations with the spirituals, the spirituals, a certain type of song. We explore these songs, the theological content of them, and see how they tie into Scripture. Today there'll be a lot of reading from Lamentations, but there'll also be excerpts from this genre of song called the Negro spirituals. These songs were penned by anonymous slaves. We don't really know who wrote any of them. There's almost 6,000 that we have cataloged today. Surely many more were written. Surely many more were sung and composed. Some have been lost forever. The ones that we do have, though, are amazing. They speak to pain in a way that is utterly unique and powerful. And that's why we want to look at these. And that's why it makes sense to look at them in parallel with the book of the Bible about lamenting before the Lord. And so as we look in the gospel, uh, the gospel through the spirituals, just think about even the first two songs we've sung already. Go tell it on the mountain. That is a spiritual. That's where it comes from. And it's a song about Jesus Christ being born. And you may say, well, that doesn't speak to pain. That's the beauty of the spirituals. They're not only about pain, and even when they are, they still point to something, should I say someone, who is Jesus. These spirituals are utterly Christ-centered and God-centered. And even with Go Tell It on the Mountain, you can see a jubilation and an excitement realizing how important it is that God himself has been incarnated, come into this world. These slaves understood that. Because they knew that meant freedom from sin. They knew it meant eternal freedom. They knew it meant a lasting freedom. And that's important because a lot of times the slaves in this life would set their hopes on the next thing. Maybe the next law that would be passed. Maybe another country. Maybe move into Chicago. Maybe go into Canada. But whenever they would get there, it was never as good as it was supposed to be. And... We're even going to learn about, even if you could get your physical liberation and freedom in this life, slave catchers could come get you and return you. And sometimes they would even do it to innocent folk who were never slaves. And so they realized their hope is not in this world. That doesn't mean they didn't do anything, but it just means that they understood ultimate freedom comes through Jesus Christ. So they pointed to him, I shall not be moved shows the utter reliance and dependence and faithfulness in God's word and what he says. That's the only one they realize you can trust. And it specifically mentions the Bible, for example, in that song. Now, before we go through this, I think it's important to ask a question because people might get the idea, well, man, we're talking about these songs composed by slaves. Are we really saying slavery wasn't that bad or something like that? No, we are not saying anything like that. And you may be saying, well, doesn't the Bible itself, isn't it like okay with slavery? There's a lot to talk about that. I can only mention some things in relationship to it. So let's look at this question before we go any further to get it out of the way as much as we can here. Does the Bible condone, that means, is it okay with it? What happened in the transatlantic slave trade? Transatlantic slave trade means slave snatchers going into the Ivory Coast of Africa, snatching folks out and then selling them. Uh, sometimes they would do it straight up kidnap style. Sometimes they would trade goods with African kings who had conquered them. It was a whole complex system of evil that had been set up and everybody cooperated in the evil. Does the Bible condone that type of thing? Because really antebellum, that means basically pre-war, pre-civil war Southern uh, United States, basically. Antebellum slavery seems to be the worst type of slavery in, the human, in human history. There's always been slavery because humans have always sinned and clearly slavery is a form of that. But this slavery is the worst of the worst. It's not like Greco-Roman slavery, much worse. And a big part of it was kidnapping. What does the Bible say about kidnapping? If you could turn to the book of Exodus, keep your finger in limitations, but let's go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, Exodus 21, 16. So this is God's word to Israel, his chosen people, as they're learning how to become a nation themselves. 
and watch what Yahweh says to his people about this. We're gonna look at two passages that God specifically gives to the Israelites so you can know how he feels about this right off the jump. Now, you're gonna notice there's capital punishment for kidnapping when I read this. Now, does that mean that there should be capital punishment for kidnapping now? I don't know, that's a different question, but it's not like it all of a sudden became good to kidnap people, right? Regardless of what we say the punishment should be. Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. If you go and you steal a man, isn't that an interesting way to put it, right? Because that gets at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not steal. Man stealing, literally, is what's going on here. And sells him, you're worthy of death, but not just that, whoever ends up with this person, the person who bought him, the person who knows, the person who is involved, maybe who hired him to go snatch him, they should be put to death in ancient Israel. Let's look at another one. It's only two books over. It's in Deuteronomy. So it goes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then towards the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 7. If you could turn there. I want you to be able to see all these. Mark them down, study them later. These are good passages. Ex, uh, Deuteronomy 24, 7. Let's read this. If a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel... And if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So you notice there uh, the way it's described. It's called evil in the midst. And again, it's referred to as stealing. And the person who is guilty of this is considered a thief. You're stealing literally the person's body and everything else associated with them. Just understand, just these two passages alone would totally have done away with if, if, if obeyed and if followed what happened in its transatlantic slave trade. It's done. It's not like this became okay or good, but it's not just the Old Testament. In fact, let's go to 1 Timothy. So again, we are going to go back to Lamentations, but you need to go all the way back to the end of your Bible, close to it. And after 2 Thessalonians, you look and you see, uh, I'm sorry, right before 1 Thessalonians, you see this little tiny book called 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. And then in chapter one, Paul, the apostle, was writing to Timothy, a young pastor at Ephesus, and he speaks about the use of the law. That's the Old Testament holiness code given by Yahweh to his people. And I want to look, we can't look at the whole passage, but I want to look at some of this and let you see what the New Testament says says about this as well, because we're going to come to a word here in the text that's translated as enslavers, sometimes it's translated as kidnappers. The word literally means in the Greek, man stealers or man thieves. Uh, That's literally what it means. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I'll start with verse 8. Now we know that the law was good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law was not laid down for the just, but for the, so this is the way the folks who do these things are described. The lawless and disobedient, the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane. And then look, it mentions murderers. And right after murderers, you go a few ones over and it says enslavers. And Paul says that this is contrary to sound doctrine. So enslaving people, man stealing, is contrary to sound doctrine, according to scripture. There's more we could say about that question in relation to scripture, but never forget those verses. Never forget the way the Bible views kidnapping as thievery. It's not okay, and in the Old Testament, the punishment was death. Now, how bad exactly was antebellum slavery? Well, let's look at the tragic story of Margaret Garner. This is uh, one of many stories that could be told during this time, but I think it's good to bring out one just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with and to begin to understand So, Margaret Garner was born June 4th, 1834 on a Kentucky plantation. She was married later on in life to a man named Robert. And Margaret and Robert, along with some other folks, on January 28th, 1856, while Margaret was pregnant, 
and had four children total, escaped from Kentucky, and they went into Cincinnati. Now, this is 1856, though. In 1850, something called the Fugitive Slave Act was passed because there had been prior laws in the United States that basically said, hey, you can go snatch your slaves if they go to free states, but the northern states found ways to circumvent them using states' rights and things along those lines to basically not really have to enforce these Fugitive Slave Acts that had been passed prior to 1850. The one in 1850, though, had a lot more teeth in it. And by the way, just let me stop here. What does this teach us? Laws, just because they're laws, are not necessarily moral. Some of you guys, sometimes when you make an argument for something to be right or wrong, you'll say, well, it's legal. So is this. Just because something is codified in a law, and I don't care if they're wearing black robes or not, it does not make it just and right and moral. Our standard is not the Supreme Court, but our standard is the Supreme Being, right? So you got to understand, remember this. And if someone says, well, if the majority of people agree with it, then it's okay, right? The majority of people, apparently, at least enough to pass this law, thought it was all right. And the folks in the North who didn't think it was all right had to make compromises with the South, so they were willing to compromise with the evil. Do you understand? Please remember this, because you have things like the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Well, they were only there in Cincinnati for 28 days. And in, well, while they were there, they went to a man that they knew was a freed slave. They stayed at his house for a while. And the man didn't really know how to get them out properly. So he went to a white abolitionist, a man named Levi Coffin, a Christian preacher type guy for safety. And he said, I'll help you out. So while Levi Coffin and uh, the man Joe Kite was his name, the house they were staying at, we're going to figure this out, how to help this family, this group, including Margaret Garner, slave catchers who use bloodhounds. So abolitionists actually called this Fugitive Slave Act law, they nicknamed it, they called it the bloodhound law because they would use bloodhounds to track the folks down. Slave catchers and U.S. Marshals went to Kite's house. They barricaded it before the man could return. So the slaves are stuck in there. And on the outside, you have U.S. Marshals and slave catchers. And there's a little battle. Robert Garner, Margaret's husband, fired several shots. He wounded at least one deputy marshal. But here's the story I need to tell you. Margaret Garner took a butcher knife, and she wounded several of her children. Her plan was to kill her children and then to kill herself because she realized this meant going back. <clears throat> but... She did kill her two-year-old daughter, Mary. She killed her. And that's the uh, picture there that was painted several years later. And uh, this story has been told numerous times. There's a novel written in the late 80s about it. And Oprah Winfrey made a movie out of it, actually. I, think, I believe it's called Beloved. And even actually in 2006, they turned it into an opera. So the story has been told. But imagine the, the mother who loves her children who is willing to kill her own children so they don't go back into slavery. And in our opening passage, <clears throat> Leviticus 2, you see that it says, should woman eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care. So you see in the lament, speaking of women under siege, and they would have to uh, eat their own children as a way to survive the siege when armies would block off supplies to the city. And here you see, yes, it's not identical, but it's certainly parallel. A woman who, because she doesn't want them to go back into slavery, kills her two-year-old daughter with plans of killing the rest and including herself. Now, it doesn't get really any better because this is obviously murder still, but you can't try property with murder. And so the defense and the persecution had two different ways to approach this case of this woman, Margaret Garner, because under the Fugitive Slave Act, she's property, but under Ohio law, she's a person. 
And so the slave catchers argued for the precedence of the federal law. That way she couldn't be tried with murder, so that way they could still have her be their slave. Because they weren't really that worried about the two-year-old daughter that she had killed. They just wanted her back to be the slave. The defense attorney tried another strategy, and this is interesting. He tried a strategy saying that the Fugitive Slave Act violated religious liberty because it forced Christians who did not think slavery was right to violate their conscience by having to turn in runaway slaves. So he went through the route of religious liberty, that this violates the Christian conscience. That didn't work either. So she ends up back in slavery. And then on March 11th, 1856, she's on a steamboat, her whole family there. And this is after all this went down, she's back in slavery. And the boat collided with another boat, began to sink. Margaret and her infant, she was pregnant at the time, remember, so now the baby is born, were thrown over in the collision, the baby drowned. Margaret made it out, went to New Orleans to be a household servant there, and then in 1858, died of typhoid fever. This is just the life of one slave woman, Margaret Garner. A tragic story. And, and what I want to do is show you that people like this in this situation still held on, but not because of the goodness of, you know, the federal laws. They held on to Jesus Christ. And so none of us probably will experience anything like what she experienced in our life, but there's legitimate things that we should lament about. But I want to teach us to learn how to lament biblically. Because one thing you can't walk away with here today is to think vocab was teaching us that we can grumble and complain to the Lord. Grumbling and complaining to the Lord was always judged in Scripture. If you remember the Israelites in the wilderness, lamenting to the Lord, and there's a difference, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is actually commanded. And so here's an excerpt from a song Tina is going to read or sing a little bit of a song called Steal Away the Jesus. And the idea with the Steal away means turn to or go to Jesus. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Oh, steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay. Thank you. That shows us a little bit of the theology of the spirituals. Again, these songs are sometimes called Negro spirituals. I'm just going to call them spirituals the whole time. There's a theology there, meaning the writers understood and believed certain things about the God of the Bible that show up in their music. Your theology shows up in the way you sing and what you write. Firstly, God hears. That's right there in those spirituals that God hears. Otherwise, why would you be lamenting to him? Why would you be speaking to him? Why would you be singing, talking to him? If he wasn't aware, if he was passive in the situation, if he was not able to hear you. But God hears, and God still hears our prayers. Some of us don't lament that much because we really don't pray that much, and that's a key place to do it. So learn to lament in your prayers because God hears. Also, God cares. If he could just hear, but he's kind of like, you know, old school dad reading the paper. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Well, he ain't really caring. He's apathetic towards your situation. No point in really speaking to that guy either. But this God cares as well as hears. And best of all, God helps. God helps. He helped the children of Israel after 400 years more of of being enslaved in Egypt. And yeah, you better believe the slaves saw that and realized that and thought that was a beautiful place for them to look and see what God thinks about slavery and how he can bring deliverance. But not every slave experienced any type of freedom in their life. But if they knew Christ, they had a deeper, bigger freedom. What is the ultimate way in which God helps? Because even if you get out of slavery and then you go and 
live like a heathen or whatever for the next 30 years and you die, you'll face God's judgment and wrath. How does God help the most with that problem? The triune God himself, through the person of Jesus Christ, comes, willingly takes on the form, Philippians 2 says, of a servant, and humbled himself to the point of death, obedient unto death, death on the cross. Why? To give us permanent liberation from the bondage of sin. We are all born into bondage. The bondage is bound to sin. We are all bound to it. It's our master, Scripture says, prior to Christ. We all know that because we sin. We all know that because we do stuff we don't want to do. But God judges that because he's holy and perfect and just. Whether slave or free, you've got to deal with that. There was a line in one of the songs we were thinking about singing, and it's a spiritual, and I love the line. I'm going to paraphrase it, but it said, even if you're white, pure as the driven snow, if you don't know Jesus, to hell you will go. <laughs> that was the line in one of the spirituals. True enough. And so how does God help? It's ultimately through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you listen to the songs we're going to sing at the end, you'll hear them speaking of Jesus Christ on the cross. They'll say, were you there when they crucified my Lord, for example? That's going to be important. You're going to hear a song called, Give Me Jesus. You can have all this world, Give Me Jesus. Some of us, and you know, it's okay. That's why we're doing the sermon series. You thought that song was written by Jeremy Camp. It's written by an unknown anonymous slave in the 1800s who will never receive any BMI checks or ASCAP royalties for it, but he wrote it for Jesus Christ. And he said, give me Jesus. So there's the theology of the spirituals, but watch this little switcheroo. That's the theology of the book of Lamentations. Because as you look at Lamentations, you see the same undergirding theology there. And what had happened in Lamentations? God had judged this city, and so this city, Jerusalem, which is supposed to be a city of peace, was surrounded and destroyed. Nothing left. And the survivors, the inhabitants of the city, were carted off into various places, especially to Babylon. And so it seems, tradition says, we're not exactly sure, technically it's anonymous, but probably the prophet Jeremiah, this is why sometimes he's called the weeping or the wailing prophet, Jeremiah composed the book of Lamentations, five acrostic poems that utilize all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, all speaking to Yahweh God about their plight. You heard one of the sections that Tina read in the beginning, and now we're going to get into some more to show you the theology of the book of Lamentations and maybe give us a model, a paradigm of how to lament in a way that is biblical. We want to have a theology of a big God. And the beauty of these slave songs with their limited vocabulary, and nobody went to seminary, but they still had a whole a trust in God's control and power and sovereignty, a big God theology, because that, they also understood he could do something. He could perform miracles on their behalf. They understood that. That's a big God theology. Think about a slave singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's a spiritual originally. It has much deeper meaning when you realize the person's condition writing this. They've been snatched or forefathers, foremothers snatched away from the west coast of Africa, now transported to God knows where, cut off everything, cut off from everything they know. And yet they're still willing to affirm with gladness. The song is a joyful song. He's got the whole world in his hands. I'm going to read now various passages from the book of Lamentations. And what I'd like you to do is open up back to Lamentations. This is a part where really just going to ask you to read along. Because I've been talking a lot, but now I really want to let the words speak. And I want us to see the way Lamentations is. And then after that, Tina's going to sing or read a spiritual that kind of coincides. And I'll make some comments along the way. I'm going to be reading from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 17 through 26. And then Tina is going to give us a snippet of a, of a spiritual call. I want Jesus to walk with me. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 17 through 26. Hear God's word. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. 
So I say, my endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There's a whole hymn from that line. The Lord is my portion. That means the Lord is what satisfies you. He's, he's your chunk of satisfaction. He's the peace you want. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, soul nourishment. Therefore, I will hope in him. Do you hope in the Lord this morning? I hope you do. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, for the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes God's not going to explain to you why, what's happening. You're not going to know. You're not going to understand. But the Bible says sometimes it's good for your soul to wait quietly on the salvation of the Lord. That's part of the lament as well, is waiting quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. To walk with me all along my pilgrim journey. Thank you, Tina. There's some other lines I want to share from that song. In my trial, Lord, walk with me. When the shades of life are falling, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. In my sorrow, Lord, walk with me with me. When my heart is aching, Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. In my troubles, Lord, walk with me. In my troubles, Lord, walk with me. When my life becomes a burden, the whole of life is a burden. That's my commentary. That's not part of the song. Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. Let's turn now to Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 34 through 37, Lamentations chapter 3, 34 through 37. And again, as I read this, I, I do ask that you follow along in your Bible. Let it impact you that way. Don't, don't know that you look at me, look down at scriptures or you read it. I do ask that you do that so you can really be exposed to what's being said. So even though Jeremiah views what's happening to Jerusalem as God's judgment for sin, which it is in this case, he still realizes in the process, injustice is being done. And so listen to the way he calls it out. Lamentations chapter three, verse 34 through 37. To crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to deny a man justice in the presence of the most high, to subvert a man in his lawsuit. I think that happened to Margaret. The Lord does not approve. Let me stop there. That's a good last line. The Lord does not approve. And now we come probably to one of the few spirituals I imagine almost everybody would know. And it's a wild song when you think about it because it's going to speak about trouble and pain and only Jesus knows and understands it. And in, I don't know how much we're going to sing of it, but if you, the totality of the song is, it almost seems out of nowhere. It says, oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Think about that contrast of the spiritual, as Tina sings, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. 
Anybody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Lamentations chapter 3, if you could go to verse 49. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 49. This passage is longer. Let's look at this. It's going to go to verse 66. Hear God's word. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate of all the daughters of my city. I've been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. They flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. Water closed over my head. I said, I am lost. Called your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. You have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. It means given it value and worth again. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. You have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold, they're sitting and they're rising. I am the object of their taunts. You will pay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart. Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens, O Lord. Now, you see there the hope and ultimate justice. And for everyone here, no one in here is literally a slave like in the antebellum south. But still injustice done, still going around. And I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for justice in this earth in a biblical way, but do not be fooled and think that ultimate justice in this earth will properly be meted out. It will not because there's unjust judges, unjust laws. Not everything is seen. It's just how it is in this realm. If you come here and materialism and atheism is your worldview, meaning all that exists is physical matter, you got to realize this is all there is. And there is no justice. Even putting away somebody behind bars, you know, one of these cats that murdered 25 people, they really paid properly for what they've done. Sometimes they'll give them three life sentences just to prove a point, I guess, but that's, there's not, it's not real justice. But here's what's crazy. All of us have committed unjust acts and all of us will be judged by a holy God unless our holiness and perfection is found not in our good works because that's not going to cut it in Christ. So sometimes it's easy to see this and be like, yeah, but there's different levels to be sure, but everyone commits sin and a just God punishes it. And this next song is a beautiful little song, Ride On King Jesus, a hope and a trust that Jesus is going to come back as a conquering king. And the Bible speaks of this in Revelation. He's going to enact judgment on the earth. The first time he came, he was a suffering servant. Sometimes people will say, well, look at all these other messianic prophecies. They weren't fulfilled the first time around when Jesus came. That's right. They will be fulfilled, though, in the second coming. And so this song, this spiritual, speaks to that. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder him. No man can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder him. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder him. No man can hinder him. Isn't that a great line? No man can hinder him. I want to read some of the lines to this spiritual. Some of it's, <laughs> it's just some good stuff. Jesus rides on a milk white horse. No man can hinder him. The river Jordan he did cross. No man can hinder him. If you want to find your way to God, 
no man can hinder him. The gospel highway must be trod, no man can hinder him. I was young when I begun, no man can hinder him, but now my race is almost run. Indeed, no man can hinder him. Last passage from the book of Lamentations. This is a book I encourage us to get into, to read. See what biblical godly lament looks like. Again, it's not just complaining and murmuring, but bring these things to God. A lot of times we complain to people who can't fix the problem and we end up just gossiping about stuff or we just end up bitter. We go online, social media, make some anonymous, you know, dear people that hate me post. Why don't you bring your lament in a biblical godly way to the one who can fix it and change it or fix you and change you as you lament in the midst of it. Last one, Lamentations chapter five, verses 11 through 21. It's good stuff in here. Women are raped in Zion. Young women in the towns of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Should we take that one out of context? Sorry, it's a bad joke. But seriously, young men are compelled to grind at the mill. So you hear a description there, really, of forced labor, right? And boys stagger under loads of wood. The old men have left the city gate. The young men, their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this our heart has become sick. For, the, for these things our eyes have grown dim. From Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. If you hear this and you're outside of Christ, know that he can restore you. If you hear this and you're in Christ and you're going through lament, know that he can restore you. That looks different for each person as far as their temporal circumstances. But restoration as far as our permanent circumstances looks the same. He buys us back out of slavery to sin and gives us freedom and hope and a permanent city. See, this lament actually is written to a city. Now, the city, of course, represents the people and all that, but it's a, a poem that's sad over the destruction of Jerusalem. But we know, don't we, that all cities, indeed all kingdoms and all empires and all nations, they have an end. Did the Roman Empire last forever? It did not. We know that. How about the Neo-Syrians? Do, do we even know anything about them? I mean, you have to like study ancient Near Eastern history to know what the Neo-Assyrian Empire is. Yet they were a great, mighty, powerful kingdom. The Persians, the Hittites, Babylonians, the Neo-Babylonians, the Syrians. You just go on and on and on and you say, it doesn't last. The United States of America. But yet the Bible points us to a permanent city. It points us to a city that is eternal, that lasts forever. A city that will never go away. And I'm going to read a passage as I reiterate this one more time, a passage from the book of Revelation. By the way, let me help you guys out. It's the book of Lamentations, but the book of Revelation. There is no S on Revelation in the Bible. Some of you guys sound like Medea, always saying Revelations. It is Revelation. You could say there's Revelations in there, but it's the book of Revelation. Just trying to help you out. So we talked about the theology of the spirituals, the theology of limitations, and identically, speaking of the theology of the Christian lament. This is the Christian who speaks out to a God who hears, a God who cares, a God who helps, and has a big God theology. I pray that you have a big God theology as we leave today. And before I read this last passage, Tina, do you want to read this one or want me to read this one, the poor pilgrim one? I got oh, it? I can, I can sing. Okay, well, really? All right. So Tina is going to sing one more of the spirituals. This one's called Poor Pilgrim. And in it, you see someone who realizes their hope is not in any city on earth. And then I'll read Revelation and then we will close. Sometimes I'm tossed. 
Sometimes I'm tossed and driven I'm driven, Lord And I just don't know Well, I don't know which way to roam Trying to make it Oh, trying to make it home Said I want to make heaven Heaven my home There's a line in that song which says Ain't got no hope in this world for tomorrow but the alternate line says i've heard of a city a city called heaven let's read about that revelation 21 as we close look at verses one through eight and you can turn there just go to the very end of your bible the very back of your bible it's the last book in scripture revelation 28 verses one through eight Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Let me skip over to verse 22. I want to read this last spot, then I'm going to pray and close. And after I do this, we're going to sing some spirituals together. And I pray that we sing with understanding. And some of you may, don't cross too much of a ruckus, you may want to go grab. If you got kids in the back, they could come join us for these last four songs we sing together because we're doing things a little different. Most of the songs are at the end. Feel free to grab some. Just try to do a chill. Last part, verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gate will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life.